All right, so good morning, everybody. Here it is, August 8th, 2020. We are in the, uh, what, the second Saturday of the month of August here. And uh, we're gonna be looking today at Paul's uh, address on Mars Hill. We're here on South Beach, as we are every Saturday morning, South Beach Gospel Ministries, Street Evangelism Mission. Good morning, God bless. And uh, glad to have all you guys with us. Today we're gonna be looking at Paul's address on Mars Hill and his Mars Hill address is one of one of his most famous ones as I adjust the camera here and angle a little bit he uh, was speaking to Greeks basically um, uh, in Greece if you will and he was on his third missionary journey when he actually stopped in Athens and had an opportunity to speak on Mars Hill. So we're going to look at Act 17 and how it started out and we'll start out just by by taking taking a look and see what we have there. Um, Paul starts out in Thessalonica. It says in, in Acts chapter 17, for those of you guys that are following along at home, it says, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Thessalonica obviously is a place where Paul established his uh, a church there and he wrote the first and second letters to the Thessalonians and it was in 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 that we get the famous passage about the rapture um, so that's very important uh, and it says you know when they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews Paul as his manner was went in unto them for three Sabbath days and reasoned with them for the scriptures so what that means basically is that you know the Jews they met at on the Sabbath, on the Saturday, the same way like the church in the West meets on a Sunday. So he spent three weeks there basically trying to explain to the religious people in the temple that Jesus is the Messiah. And it says, as his habit was. So what do we take away from that? We take away from that that Paul made clear that his primary goal as a follower of Jesus Christ was to promote the mission of the church, which isn't building houses, in Haiti or clean drinking water in Africa or doing you know good deeds or social justice type activity his primary focus was to preach the gospel so he went in and what did he do he reasoned Steve says you know he later would write that we must always be able to give a reason for the hope that we have in us in other words not just saying well my parents were born you know Buddhist so I'm a Buddhist my parents were born Catholic so I'm a Catholic my parents were born Jehovah's Witness so I'm a Jehovah's Witness so he's saying that as, as biblical Christians, we've got to understand what the Word of God says, and then we've got to be able to, with intelligence and reasoning, be able to explain it to them in a way that would be consistent with, with intellect. So it says that, you know, Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them for three Sabbath days, meaning for three weeks, reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ so Paul didn't waste time debating social policies he didn't get in and say you should vote for Julius Caesar because Augustus is, is not good you know he didn't come in and tell you which political candidates he thought would be most consistent with the church and you know as we get closer and closer to the uh, you, you 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 almost forget in the midst of this worldwide uh, scandemic uh, you know lockdown that there's a presidential election coming up and I, I, I see in social media that people are kind of taking positions and whatever and I the disturbing trend I think is that you know evangelical Christians or people who call themselves evangelical Christians seem to be more interested in many cases in promoting political candidates and political positions than in doing what the real mission of the church is. And the real mission of the church, of course, is what? It is preaching the gospel, Steve. So, yep, you got that right. And so, again, Paul, he didn't waste time, you know, getting distracted with things of that nature. He went right in, and in the synagogue, instead of talking about, you know, whether or not, you know, this decision of the synagogue was the appropriate one or not, what he did was he went in and he preached the gospel as I adjust my microphone here. There we go. 
Um, so, it, it, and, and that's the model I think that, that we as part of the church should be picking up. The model should be to do the mission which is to take the gospel and give it to the people. So he gave reasons for them to believe that. And what, what his gospel was, wasn't doing good or uh, trying to cure the homeless problem or trying to eradicate anti-Semitism in synagogues in Greece. Greece or, or whatever you know n not that any of those things wouldn't be valid issues you know from day-to-day -day life but what he focused on was the mission which was convincing people that Jesus who had died rose from the dead and was the Messiah and again that was the mission of the church and you know the openly and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen from the dead and that this Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah of the Jewish people that was the whole mission of the church. That was controversial. That got Paul locked up, thrown into jail repeatedly throughout his, you know, 30 or 40 year earthly ministry. He spent most of the time in and out of jail when he wasn't traveling from city to city. Then it goes on to say in verse 4, interestingly enough, it says, Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. In other words, meaning a lot. So he went to these uh, Grecian Jews and the people of this particular area in Greece, and he shared with them this new idea that Jesus was the Messiah, that he had to die, that his death wasn't some tragedy. And I remember I spoke a week or so ago, I uh, pointed out that one guy claiming to be a Christian, you know, posted on social media that Jesus got himself killed by accident it was, a, it was a tragedy but you know he recovered from it but it wasn't his intention to get killed he came to set up some kind of happy-go-lucky religion and Paul made clear that it was the entire point of his coming the first time to be the blood sacrifice and to die for our sins and so obviously that has to be part of the gospel message. For there to be good news, which is what gospel means, there has to be bad news as well. The bad news is that Jesus had to die for our sins so that we don't have to spend eternity in the lake of fire. And if we, if he didn't do it for us, then we would have to be in the lake of fire. So somebody's got to take, you know, the weight. Somebody's got to take the hit for the sin debt that the people of the planet Earth have been building up since the fall in the garden here with Adam and Eve. 6,000 years ago and so Paul made that clear and the result was that some of them believe not everybody believe when we come out here on Saturdays and you know uh, preach the gospel and we pass out gospel tracts not everybody accepts the track and you know turns to Christ immediately that's just the way it is we are basically postal delivery men for the Lord we go out we take the mail which is the gospel of Jesus Christ whether it be in the form of a track or whether it reading the, the Bible open air and we give it to the people and let the people decide what to do with it and Paul did the same thing now he made arguments and he reasoned with the people and that's what we do and that's why we record these and put these on YouTube you know so like and follow us on you know uh, South Beach Gospel Ministry at YouTube uh, and South Beach Gospel Ministry also uh, on Facebook and we also every Thursday night from 7 to 9 we're live at southbeachgospel.com and so yeah we do this so that people will get a chance to hear what the arguments are for why Jesus is the Messiah and why you must be born again in order to get into the kingdom of heaven and to the extent that people choose not to there's nothing we can do about it that's not our decision to make God doesn't give the church the authority to superimpose their belief system on other people you see that happening in some religions, such as Islam, you know, where, you know, if you're born in a certain country, you pretty much have to be that religion or else, you know. And so we don't see that model in Scripture. We see, we give them the opportunity, some believed and some didn't. But it said, you know, some of the chief men and some of the chief women, you know, there were women that were involved in, in, in you know, civil society and governmental society. In Thessalonica at this period of time which this is probably in the early 60s AD late 50s AD 57 AD thereabouts so Paul was able to convert 
both men and women, both Jews and Gentiles. And what he converted them with wasn't signs and wonders. It wasn't a prosperity gospel that if you give me money, God's going to give you a mansion. He said nothing about that. His gospel was very simple. And again, it was opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, meaning be crucified, and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus that rose from the dead is the Christ, meaning the Messiah, the one that was foretold in all of the Old Testament prophecies. And we looked last Thursday at uh, you know, the first half of the book of Zechariah and how Zechariah, you know, prophet raised up by the Lord at the time of the rebuilding of the second temple in Israel, how he preached that a Messiah was coming and that the temple has to be built. For those of you that didn't catch it, you can go on to our uh, YouTube page, Southeast Gospel Ministries, and look at uh, the, the teaching we did this past Thursday on Zechariah. Zechariah was used by God, a young man who was born in captivity in Babylon, who was a, used by God as a priest and intercessor with the people and as a prophet and who said hey people we got to rebuild this temple why because the messiah is coming and the messiah can't come if there's no temple to come for so we got to get this thing done and then the messiah that we've all been waiting for all these years will come and so jews have been waiting since abraham isaac and jacob started that nation of israel long ago and far away they've been waiting for what the promised messiah that is first promise where steve can you remember the first messianic prophecy? Uh, Genesis 3. There we go, right there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, gives us the very first messianic prophecy where God says, as he's, you know, you know, pronouncing punishment on Satan, he says, I'm going to raise up the seed of the woman. He's going to crush your head and you're going to bruise the seal. That's the first prophecy related to the Messiah. And so when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, eventually populated the world with the Jewish people, uh, they were told to look forward to this period of time when this individual will come to establish the kingdom of God on earth. And so they've been looking for that. So Paul's message included mentioning to the Jews that, hey, yeah, this guy that you guys have been waiting for, Jesus is that Messiah that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were looking for all those years ago. And so let's move on. It goes on to say that after he did that, you know, uh, a guy named Jason who was, I guess, uh, he was a believer in Thessalonica. His house got assaulted. Why? Because preaching the gospel has always been a controversial thing. And it will be a controversial thing, Steve, until we get out of here. And when I say get out of here, I mean the rapture, which, which is coming. We don't know when it's coming, but it could be sooner than we think. But since the Bible teaches us plainly that Satan is the god of this world and not Jesus, we find it not unusual that we would face opposition in the form of spiritual uh, oppression, spiritual roadblocks, the prince of the power there, and we would also, hey, God bless you, man. We would also find that the individuals who are doing the work for Satan, who are under his influence or under the influence of his spiritual colleagues, might also give us opposition. So sometimes when we have supernatural opposition down here, you know, people come up and give you a hard time for whatever reason, you don't know why. Sometimes that's a spiritually manipulated person who has, dare I say it, demonic entities operating within them that they don't even know about. And so, again, the best way to look at what it is that we do as believers in Jesus Christ is to see ourselves as soldiers who are at war. Now we look forward to the time when the war is over and we win the battle and we get to go home from, from you know, the enemy lines and all that stuff, but that time isn't yet. That time is apparently coming relatively quickly. If we look at the signs of the times that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, we see, even with this worldwide pandemic happening, that uh, times have changed and that we are in a different paradigm than we've ever been in the history of the planet Earth. And because of that, I think it's clear that we can believe that Jesus will be coming back very shortly. So that means that, you know, just as Steve is over there contending with the people, like, hey, I know you from, you're the guy that passes out the gospel track. So 
it's nice, Steve, that people recognize you know who you are. Why? Because you put in work. Now, if I were a rich man, I'd pay you a, a healthy salary for coming out and doing all this work that nobody else really wants to do. But since I, I'm not, I, and I can't, you're going to have to get, wait till you get to heaven. But then when you get to heaven here at the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat after the rapture, the Bible says we're all going to be presented to Jesus Christ there. And those of us who have done work on behalf of the kingdom, on behalf of the Lord, on behalf of right now, Steve, when you're doing work that a secular employer would pay you handsomely for. But since you don't have a secular employer and you're working for the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't get paid now. And so Benny Hinn and Paula White and all of these uh, advisors to the president, by the way, and again, I don't want to get political, but I get more and more disturbed as we get closer to November and I hear more and more evangelical Christians promoting a president of the United States as if he is the Messiah himself. Um, so again, you're not going to get paid now, but you will later. So Paul did his job and the reward was that some got saved and then he got assaulted. So, you know, it's, it's, that, it's that stunning contrast, you know, that we have. Being a follower of Jesus Christ, wonderful, awesome things can happen. And also, you can expect uh, that since you put the name of Jesus on your forehead, you've got a target on your back as well. And that you're going to get oppression from the world. And the world is going to be manipulated, maybe without them even knowing it, by Satan or one of his, uh, you know, uh, Luciferian lieutenants who occupy the air and are basically trying to keep the gospel from being spread, especially as we get to the very closing end of this long war against God that's been waged now for 6,000 years. And of course, we're going to win. The book of Revelation says so. But we're not going to win here and now. We're not going to want be the one that defeats sin and evil and Satan as the New Apostolic Reformation false teachers suggest that the church will eradicate evil on the earth, get rid of Satan, and then Jesus can come out of hiding at his father's house in heaven and come back and inherit a throne that the church has prepared for him. It's exactly the opposite. We fight and wage war on behalf of Jesus, though we never are going to win the battle by ourselves. He gives us the power to sustain ourselves so that we don't have to. Bye, fellas. And the police cavalcade, ocean drive is closed down. We have, you know, when we show up, there's, there's all manner of military vehicles and police vehicles. So we got like six or seven police vehicles set up in the, just off our, our, our sound stage here. And they they found something else to go do, yeah. and so so that's great. Now we can have some peace and quiet. Because remember last week, Steve, we remember they came over and we, we thought we were going to get shut down, and then they had to get the Miami Beach code compliance officer had to come out and say, no, no, these guys are okay, leave them alone. So again, when you, when you when you pick up the mantle of truth and you go out and you preach the gospel, Steve, you never know what you're going to encounter. And it's kind of a scary thing as I'm driving down, Steve, but it's, it reminds me of my old college football days and, and you know, competing in sports. Just before the game, before the kickoff, you got to sort of, you, you're doing it because you like it, but there's a tenseness and you're kind of wondering, like, man, I wonder how it's going to go today. Hope it's, hope it's not an embarrassing game for me, you know, and you're a little worried. Is your opponent much better than you? And, and, and so with each each effort when we come out here, there's always that doubt in the back of like, what new intrigue will Satan have waiting for me at 15th and Ocean Drive on South Beach today? And so, again, the Lord gives grace, and each week, you know, something good happens, and last week was an awesome time, and again, we, if, if, you, if you have the mindset that you're a soldier and that you're at war, then you're not going to be terribly upset when, oh, somebody comes up, oh, you can't do that, and or, or some demon-possessed person comes and hits you in the head with a coconut, hey, good morning, God bless, which is what happened to me right over there a few years back. Um, but that's okay because the gospel was preached and people got saved. Um, but yeah, if that's your mindset, that you're sort of a mercenary and you're behind enemy lines and you're ready for action, you're ready for whatever occurs, and you aren't going to be thrown too much off your spot or off your mark. And that's one of, the, using the sports analogy, that's one of the things that makes Tom Brady a great quarterback, is that, you know, he's always prepared and 
nothing really gets him off his game. He can maintain his calm when everything around him is going crazy. And so for those of us that are out here, again, that's what Paul was doing. And Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so that's what we're doing. And I'm sure we're doing it quite imperfectly. But to the best of our abilities, it's unto the Lord. And even if it's in the eyes of the world not really awesome, in the eyes of the Lord, it's going to be awesome because you're going to get a great reward for it because of your effort. So again, Jason, who was hosting Paul and Silas in the group, his house was attacked. It says by loot fellows of a baser sort, looking at Acts chapter 17, verse 5, and they assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring Paul out to the people. And when they found him not, they threw Jason and certain of the brethren, meaning believers, and dragged him unto the city rulers, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Now, wouldn't it be awesome if somebody would accuse us of that, Steve? You know, oh no. Stephen Herb from South Beach Gospel Ministries. Those that have turned the whole world upside down, they've left South Beach and now they've come to New York City also. Oh no. Call the police, get those guys locked up. That's in essence what had happened. They knew who Paul was. They knew about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even though it started in Judea, you know, at that time, you know, when you're in Greece, uh, you know, you know, Jerusalem was the other side of the world, basically, you know, in terms of, you know, not having frequent flyer airfare, ability to fly from one continent to another in a couple hours. But the word of God had spread because of Paul's efforts, even from Judea all the way over to Greece. And when they found out that Jason, who was a believer in the city of Thessalonica, had invited Paul to come... Oh, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Good morning. God bless you guys. Thank you. That, uh, you know, Paul was being hosted in Thessalonica by Jason. You know, the city went in and over. These are the guys that have turned the whole world upside down. The whole known world at that time, Steve, was turned upside down by what? Turned upside down by Paul preaching the gospel. Not by Paul trying to rise, raise up, uh, you know, protest. To recall Caesar because he's not doing his job as the head of the Roman Empire and replace him with a more benevolent one. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so he, again, he didn't allow himself to get distracted with the very important political issues of the day. He focused on the one thing that would result in eternal life for the people, and that is what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it was great to see that the city leaders were approached by a, a, a band of people that said, these who have turned the world upside down have come here. Who? Paul and, and, and those Christians who are preaching about this Jesus who they say is the Messiah who rose from the dead and had to die for the sins of men. So he, people knew who he was. He made a difference in his town. And so the question is, in your town, does it make a difference? Last week when the police thought that maybe what we were doing would be violation of the, you know, worldwide, you know, lockdown or whatever. Thankfully, the Miami Beach code compliance officer who was assigned to come out to the scene last week knew us. Like, oh no, I know these guys. I've seen what they do before. They're not selling anything. They're not doing, they're telling people about their faith in Jesus, which is legal under the First Amendment. So because they knew who we were, we were allowed to continue on without interruption. And so, turn the world, so yeah, so Steve, in our, in our little world, our little area of the world, they know who we are. They know who South Beach Gospel Ministry is. So to our friends out in, in, in internet land, do they know who you are if you're a follower of Jesus Christ in your town? And if they don't, why not? Um, don't wanna be secret Christians, because secret Christians aren't gonna get any rewards here at the Bema seat of Christ, which is the judgment seat, um, and, and Paul adopted the word you, again, adopted from the Greeks, for the Olympic award stand. After the Olympics were completed, 
you know, you give out, you know, three medals. That's where we had silver, gold, and bronze medals were based upon the wreath, the awards that were given out at the end of the athletic competition in the Olympics of ancient time. You would go to the Bema seat and you would get your reward. You would get, you know, the gold wreath if you were the winner, and if you finished second, you got the silver wreath, and if you finished third, you got the bronze wreath. And we got the silver, gold, and bronze medals as a result of that. So Paul is saying that when we get to heaven, which is coming, because the rapture will be coming very soon, we're going to go straight to the Father's house, and we're going to proceed directly to the awards banquets, the beam of seat judgment. If you've done stuff, if during the, the race you quit, and you're like, yeah, this run of the marathon thing is not for me, I'm dropping out, then you're not going to get any re rewards, you know. You don't have to necessarily win to get the top prize to get a prize. But if you didn't complete the race and you dropped out because it wasn't for you, then you're not going to get a reward. Even if you're saved, there are going to be people, unfortunately, in heaven that are saved that aren't going to get any rewards. They're just going to be there because Jesus died for their sins and they accepted him as Savior. But then they didn't do anything with their lives after they got saved. So in your town, you want people to know who you are and why. You know, nobody wants to get beat up and thrown in jail. But if you're doing it unto Christ, there's going to be an enormous reward for you down the road. So, again, uh, these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also and do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Now, of course, it was against the Roman law to proclaim a king other than Caesar, right? You know, not only was he the king, but a few years later, he would declare himself to be God as well, so he had to worship him as God. There's gonna come a point in time, and you know, and I kinda, I, I kinda touched upon that briefly in our last Saturday's Saturday sermon, where I said, you know, God versus Caesar is how I subtitled uh, last week's teaching. You know, and I, I suggested, and I'm suggesting again, there's gonna come a period in time, Steve, when your faith in Christ it's going to conflict with Caesar and the laws of the land. And we see it right here in Acts chapter 17. Paul's preaching that there was another king, Jesus, was directly in conflict with Roman law that says Caesar is the only king. And so Jason was dragged before the magistrates for even hosting them in his house. And there's going to be a point in time when we're going to be dragged before man. It's already been happening for... You know, since the church has been founded here in the United States, you don't quite have the same oppression. But I posted a couple of videos on our Facebook page um, from other channels that talked about the efforts, you know, the California Governor Gavin Newsom has made to shut down the church because of, you know, uh, the corona crisis, if you will. And he banned singing in churches because the virus might gotta get out of your mouth while you're singing. And then he, he banned meeting all together. So now that's being fought out in the court system. And, you know, I kind of commented that I never imagined I would see it in my lifetime when the, the governors and mayors of the states of the United States of America will be actually persecuting the church in America. You know, you read about stuff in China or in uh, Saudi Arabia or in, you know, former Soviet Union, how Christians are persecuted for their faith. But you never expected to see that in the United States. But we're seeing it. It's in a subtle way, but we're seeing it more and more now, and especially since March 17th and the whole, you know, uh, worldwide shutdown crisis came to our shores as well. So, again, there is going to be a period of time when you're going you're gonna to have to choose. Nobody wants to have conflict particularly with the government, you know, Big Brother, the guy who runs the whole show. But to the extent that the Bible teaches us plainly that Satan is the god of this world and therefore all the governments of the world are under his sway or control, then you're going to eventually have a situation where you're going to have to uh, make a decision, you know, an executive decision. I'm either going to follow what Caesar says in order to curry favor with him and to stay out of his doghouse, or I'm gonna do what God says in order to curry favor with him and to stay out of his doghouse when I get to the Father's house in heaven. So, you know, which of the two powers and forces, and they're both powers, Caesar was powerful. Caesar could put people to death, and he did. And Paul found that out uh, not too, too long after, another 10 years down the road, 
Paul found out that Caesar got tired of him preaching another king, Jesus, who Paul alleged to be risen from the dead, so Caesar had his head cut off. And Paul couldn't preach anymore after Caesar cut his head off. But before Caesar cut off Paul's head, Paul preached a lot to a whole lot of people, and he established a whole lot of the churches that, that, that were extant at the time, and he wrote about 70% of this book that I'm holding in my hand, the New Testament of it, about 70% were written by this one guy we're talking about today, Paul, who, 10 years later, the Lord rewarded by allowing Caesar to cut his head off for proclaiming that there was another king other than Caesar. So that's going to happen to us eventually uh, in some form or fashion. You're going to get discriminated against at your job. Eventually when this whole RNA-based DNA morphing vaccine comes out and they say you have to have it to be able to work or to travel, you know, people are going to have to make executive decisions. And some people, again, see it as a type of precursor to the Revelation chapter 13, Mark of the Beast, where you can't buy or sell unless you take the Mark of the Beast, which kind of changes you into some kind of a, a strange genetic hybrid that makes you ineligible for salvation. But anyway, so I move on. And so, you know, uh, the, the city rulers had to rule on, on Paul and you know, these guys coming into the city. And, you know, Jason, you know, w was troubled by this. And Paul moves on from Thessalonica, where where, where the city was in an uproar, and, and they were demanding that, that Jason be arrested. So they moved on by night, picking up verse 10. It says, the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. They were worried that Paul would be arrested and maybe even killed there on the spot, which would end his earthly ministry, you know, 10 or 15 years before the Lord wanted it to. So by night, Paul and Silas had to sneak out of Thessalonica, which eventually became a, a very, very you know, prominent stronghold of, of the church. And Paul wrote a couple of letters and, and introduced the idea of the rapture. Um, but when they got to Berea, they got a better reception. It says, verse 11, these were more noble than Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily whether these things were so. And that's why Dave Hunt chose to, you know, name his ministry after this verse, the Berean Call, based upon the fact that um, he, uh, you know, that the people heard the gospel and received it with all readiness, and then they went back and searched the scriptures to see whether those things were true. And, and you know, uh, Dave Hunt, you know, one of my mentors in the faith, I and mean, he made a, a big point about saying, I don't want to be your spiritual guru, you know, don't just believe stuff because you think I'm a great speaker or because I got a white beard and I look like Moses or something like that. Go back and check in the scriptures whether the stuff I said at the Bible Prophecy Conference squares up with the Word of God. And that's what, uh, you know, the Lord is commending the Bereans for doing. They listened to Paul. They didn't just reject him. They didn't stone him. They didn't chase him out of town because they had never heard these things before. They listened to him, and then they went back and, and pulled out their copy of the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Everybody had a copy of the Old Testament. And again, as I mentioned uh, last Thursday in our teaching on Zechariah, you know, Paul was preaching from the Old Testament. He had to preach Christ from the scriptures that the people had. They didn't have the book of Revelation at this point. They didn't have, you know, all the gospels written down and, you know, you know stamped together and Jesus' words in red. They had the Old Testament prophetic passages, the law, the Torah, and the writings, and that's what Paul preached from. And so he was able to bring Christ out from the Old Testament prophecies, which is an amazing thing and a challenge for all of us. We should be able to go into the book of Zechariah, and that was the homework assignment I gave for everybody last Thursday, read through Zechariah, those chapters I specifically mentioned, specifically chapters you know, 12, 13, 14, Look at those chapters and see if you can find Christ in, in you know, the, the 13th, 12th, 13th, and 14th chapters of Zechariah. If you can't, you got a, you got a problem, man. you got to spend more time in the Word or, you know, be uh, filled with the Spirit so you can understand these things. So, uh, the Bereans uh, listened to him and then they searched the Scriptures, whether those things were so. And it says, therefore, many of them believed. Also, the honorable women, which were Greeks, and the men of the men, not a few. In other words, a bunch of the men and a bunch of the women also believed as well. So when they preached, even after being 
rejected or getting in trouble with the Roman authorities in Thessalonica, they went on to the next city, Berea, and many people believed. Not everybody believes, but many people did. So there is a benefit to preaching the gospel. You know, we, we were out here a few weeks ago and I gave a teaching called, you know, uh, indicated that we should be fools for Christ's sakes. If we're fools, the, I think the, the title that you look in on our YouTube page, it was uh, The Foolishness of Preaching the Gospel. But if you're God's fool, you get a reward for that. And so Paul did a foolish thing, but people got saved as a result of it. And he did it all while the governmental authorities were opposed to him. Because again, there was a conflict between being loyal to Caesar and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means being loyal to God. There's always been that dramatic tension and there always will be, even here in the United States of America, despite the efforts of many to try to conflate Republican partyism with being a born again Christian, which the two clearly are not the same. And as we get closer to the election, we'll see more and more clearly, hopefully the people will be clear to the people that it's not the same. Okay, and so they did that and, and then that was awesome. And so after Berea, they move on to uh, another city, Athens, city of Athens, a very famous city, you know, um, just to give you a little bit of background about Athens, Athens was the chief city of the ancient city-state of Attica, and Steve, you may remember that when we studied the history of Western civilization, um, you know, in college and in, in high school and all of that. Athens was the chief city uh, of the city-state of Attica. Uh, it was allowed to remain a free state after the Romans took over. Um, and though Athens was no longer politically and economically as influential as it once had been the case in the Old Testament, it remained a major intellectual center. You know, back there in Old Testament ancient times, Athens was the center of everything. But even at the time of Paul, it was still respected as being a center of intellectual reasoning. You know, it was sort of the sort of like Cambridge, Massachusetts that has Harvard and MIT and Boston College and Boston University all within a very you know, uh, close, close, close proximity to one another. Athens was considered a place where intellectuals and thinkers and, you know, the, the outside the box type individuals who, you know, worked with their brains. And so as a result, there was an area there where a number of people from all over the world would come to, to debate and to philosophize, if you will, over the different theories of life and what the purpose of man is. They'd be talking about Aristotle or Plato or Sophocles and whatever the you know different religious uh, paradigms of the day were. And so Paul winds up going to this city next. So now, as he's going into Athens, we find out that he has, even there, you know, and some people say, oh, well, you know, Paul wasn't as successful in Athens as he was in Thessalonica and all that. But I'm not sure that's the case because Paul went into a place where Christianity was unheard of. You know, this whole idea of Jesus was unheard of. And even, you know, the, the Jewish messianic prophecies weren't well known. And so this is where he goes next. And it says, verse 14, um, well, verse, we'll pick it up, verse 13, um, Acts 17. And when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge of the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. So the Jews from the synagogue who were angry that Paul was preaching Jesus as the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies, they felt that sort of their religious traditions were being threatened, you know, again. So you had Jews who believed in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being opposed to Paul in preaching of Jesus as the Messiah of the Old Testament. So they came all the way over from Thessalonica to stir up trouble for Paul in Berea where he was being well received. And so as a result, Paul had to flee Berea as well. Uh, and it says, and immediately the brethren, the believers in Berea, sent Paul away uh, to go as it were to sea. So he had to jump in a boat and go out to sea because he was so controversial. He was stirring up so much strife as a result of his faithfully preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they conducted Paul and brought him unto Athens. So he, he went to Athens really to escape, you know, persecution and arrest from the Thessalonican uh, Jews from the synagogue who were upset that their religious traditions were being threatened. 
You know, remember Jesus said, by your traditions you make the word of God of no effect, Pharisees. And so that same sort of conflict continues on even after the death and resurrection of Jesus. When Paul picks up the mantle, we find out that, you know, individuals in the synagogue scattered throughout Asia Minor are now uh, on alert about Paul and trying to prevent him from preaching this gospel. So uh, Timothy and Silas, who are traveling companions with Paul, they have to depart by sea with all speed, and they departed. Um, but they split up the band there. So Paul stops, and he's in Athens waiting for, for the Fuhrer to die down. And Timothy and Silas, they move on to another town. And so it says, verse 16, we're picking it up, where Paul is by himself now. His traveling and evangelism companions have gone ahead to lay the foundations to see what kind of reception they get in the next town. And while Paul is sitting there waiting, you know, for the text message to come in, hey, it's okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go on uh, over to uh, Corinth and the Corinthians will treat us nice. Come on over to Corinth. While he's waiting for that, it says, now Paul waited uh, for them at Athens. And while he waited, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city was wholly given to idolatry. So there's Paul waiting after doing a great work in uh, Thessalonica and a great work in Berea and getting himself in trouble and having people trying to kill him. He's supposed to be laying low and waiting for the next opportunity. He says, well, I can't sit around and wait. The Holy Spirit that's in me is stirring me up. I'm in a city filled with pagans. And so what does Paul do? He goes over to the town square. So, you know, if, if you were in New York City, you'd go to Washington Square Park. That's where, you know, we'd always go or where I go when I lived there. You know, hear the different debates on the different, you know, religious, metaphysical, philosophical issues. And I expound on Christianity, and other people expound on Zoroastrianism and New Age and whatever, right across the street from New York University uh, Law School. And so the Washington Square Park, if you will, of the day was Mars Hill, and also known as the Areopagus. Uh, and uh, Mars was the Roman name for the Greek god. Ares, the god of war, and uh, they named a hill after him, so um, in Latin it was referred to as Mars Hill, and in Greek it was uh, referred to as the Areopagus, or the hill of Ares. And so it was on this hill, I'm kind of standing on a hill right here, this is the hill of South Beach, if you will. Hey, good morning, God bless. Uh, we're, we're right here on the hill of South Beach, and all manner of belief systems, and we, we've seen, if you go through our videos long enough, you'll see that People will kind of walk in and they believe different things like, hey, I never heard this one before, or hey, I've never heard anybody preaching quite like this. And so you go out to where the people are. So Paul, while he had already done his missionary work for the month, he was standing by waiting for his next assignment. He decided to, on his own accord, go out by himself and to go to this place called Mars Hill and to preach. And it says, it was because he saw idolatry, worshiping false gods. Because he was such a follower of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit was now living inside of him, he just, he just was stirred up. I can't sit around and wait. I know I'm not supposed to do stuff, you know, you know, supposed to two or more, or, or, you know, uh, are required because you get a good return for your labor and all that, but I'm not waiting. So Paul went out by himself. And it says, therefore he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews. You would think he'd have gotten enough of preaching the gospel to the Jews because they were his chief adversaries. And they were the chief adversaries of Jesus. The Romans largely didn't know who Jesus was until, you know, uh, the Jewish high priest went to Pontius Pilate and made a huge stink about everything. Oh, no, you're good. Go right on through. No, no problem. We're oh. recording, but you can go right oh. on through. That's right. okay. <laughs> we're live, and that's what happens in live TV. People come through. You're part of the show now. So, uh, God bless you. Good morning. God bless you. So, yeah. Uh, so, in essence, what you have is that... Uh, Paul is doing what intellect would tell you not to do. It's counterintuitive. You got in trouble with the Jews in, in Berea, and you got in trouble with the Jews in Thessalonica to the extent that they came to Berea. Now you're going to go to to the synagogue where the Jews are in, in Athens and tell them about Jesus? Well, that's exactly what he did. So let's see what happened. Um, so Paul, being moved by the Spirit, does all these things. Not, not necessarily a good uh, financial plan. This isn't like, you know, Joel Osteen would say that, you know, there's no, uh, there's no marketing behind this, Paul. Don't do that. You know, you're going to get yourself kicked off the air uh, and you'll lose your satellite TV contract. Uh, but he didn't care. So he went in and 
he went in with the synagogue with the Jews and with devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him so he left the synagogue and then he would go preach to the Greeks in the marketplace and he started preaching them of course about Jesus something they've never heard before so we pick up verse morning verse 18 it says then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him and the Epicureans and Stoics were the two chief uh, philosophical parties kind of like you would have the Democrats and the Republicans everybody kind of knows what the Democrats positions more socially liberal Republicans more socially conservative the Epicureans and the Stoics were people that uh, promoted a certain philosophical view of life the Epicureans said the ultimate uh, goal of man is to find pleasure so eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die the Stoics were different they were like no the chief uh, you know aim of man is to obtain you know mental or psychological peace and so therefore you need to discipline yourself buffet your body make it your slave and discipline yourself so that you can find uh, psychological peace that that's the highest good for man so the Epicureans they would eat what they want they would drink what they want they enjoyed life they were easygoing people the Stoics you know they weren't necessarily the sour disgruntled people they were more disciplined like no you know there's something more to life than just fleshly pleasures or you know eating a big meal there's more uh, there's a higher good there and we have to seek that through self-discipline and sometimes self-sacrifice so both sides had arguments that were appealing to the people and Paul goes in amongst them and preaches this brand new idea the gospel of Jesus Christ and they're like well wait a minute we never heard that one that's not like the Stoics it's not like the Epicureans it's not like anything we've ever heard before and so some said what will this babbler say Others said he seemeth to be a center forth of strange gods because they, he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. They had never heard of this. Like, what's this babbler talking about? What is this about a God who came and he died and then he came back to life and so that men didn't have to die? I don't understand this. And so because they were so intrigued by Paul's comments, the Stoics and Epicureans took Paul and brought him to the Areopagus or Mars Hill in Latin saying may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is in other words they were intrigued so much they were like look you know what kid we we never heard this before but you say it with such compelling you know you seem convinced of this we're gonna take you to the the you know the town square to the Mars Hill that's where all the big-time speakers it's a very high honor to be able to speak on Mars Hill and we want to hear more about this strange thing about this God who died and came back to life that we've never heard of before so Paul gets taken over to Mars Hill by the Stoics and Epicureans the pagans who were intrigued by the truth of what Paul was saying and they took him unto and brought him unto the Areopagus saying may we know this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears and we would know therefore what these things mean in verse 21 it goes on to explain parenthetically it says for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing and I, I think of Washington Square Park in New York City because you know sometimes you know I was studying for the bar um, when I was getting ready to come to Florida so I was studying for the Florida bar but I was still living in New York so I was studying at NYU Law School and some days man you study six or seven or eight ten days in a row and you just be burned out so some days I'd be standing there in Washington Square Park and I was like well this is such an interesting debate here and then I'd engage with somebody some days I never made it into the library because I'd be in the park going back and forth and that's the way the Athenians were all the time it says for the in Washington Square Park it was, it was exactly Mars Hill you, you got every possible belief system people smoking weed people talking about vegetarianism people talking about Zoroastrianism Luciferians occultists uh, every stripe of you know uh, religious belief you didn't have too many evangelical Christians so I would go and kind of do that but you, you gave you a tremendous opportunity to be able to share your faith with people that believe all kinds of stuff. So it's a very open uh, and, and, and fertile intellectual speaking ground. So Paul, being invited to that, took the opportunity, man, and he says, you know, you know, Athenians, they and the other people that were travelers and strangers there, they, they spent all day doing nothing but to hear or tell of some new thing. And so it was a perfect platform for Paul. And Paul was like, man, okay. And so Paul then stood in the midst 
of Mars Hill, just like I'm doing here, and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things, in the King James Version it says, two superstitions. Really what he's saying here is the men of Athens, I perceive in all things that you are very religious. In other words, he's not trying to insult them or criticize them. He's commending them for being spiritual seekers because, you know, we know inherently that we are tripartite beings, mind, body, and soul. We know that there's more to life than just our physical life, eating, uh, living, and dying. There's more to life than that. And Paul commended the Athenians and the, the people of Mars Hill, or the speakers on Mars Hill, for being very religious. It's like, in other words, you're not just caught up in the material things that you see each day. You know that there's a God. In fact, I noticed that you've got shrines set up to every possible God in the whole known world, and even one to my God who you don't know, who you call the unknown God. So instead of insulting them, he is commending them in order to be able to strike a common sort of a common sense with them so that they would listen to him and you know if it wasn't necessary Paul didn't go out of his way to be rude or condescending or obnoxious with people so he says this he says men of Athens I perceive that in all things you are very religious for as I passed by and beheld your devotions I found an alt uh, altar with this inscription and then in, in caps to the unknown God he says, whom therefore ignorantly ye worship, him I declare unto you. And he starts out, this is powerful, just a few verses, but powerful, powerful address. Paul says, you know, I, I noticed, you know, as I was walking up here to Mars Hill, that you had an altar even to the unknown God. So you had Shiva, had, had, had a spot for Shiva, and then, okay, the divine Zoroaster has got, got a spot there, and then you got... You know, Allah hadn't been invented yet, so he didn't have one. Uh, but, but yeah, the ancient gods of the Zoroastrians and, you know, of the pagans, you would have Jupiter and Zeus and, you know, Ares. And in fact, the, the speaking platform was named after him. All the Greek, the Greco-Roman gods had, had, you know, altars set up. And there was even an altar to an unknown god, to the unknown god. And Paul says... This unknown God that you worship ignorantly, I'm going to declare him to you right now. And he starts out verse 24. He says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Jesus said the same thing. Neither is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. In other words, if your idol needs you to bring him food, he can't be a God. Uh, he goes on, he says, as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And he says, and hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Now there's an argument right there for the idea that when we say, you know, if, 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 if a white person discriminates against a a black person that's called racism why because uh, people from the white race think that they're superior to people from the black there are no different races of people there's one race the human race and we all come from Adam and then move through that through Noah and his three sons Shem Ham and Japheth after the flood the descendants of Adam Noah Shem Ham and Japheth gave birth to the beginning of every nation that we have on the face of the earth goes through the Genesis years, the Exodus, the laws given to Israel, and eventually Paul is preaching right about here. There aren't different races of human beings on the, on the earth. There's one race of human beings, the Adamic race. We are all sons of Adam. Different ethnic groups, uh, which, you know, sometimes will display different, you know, characteristics. Some will have darker skin than others. Some will have lighter eyes than others. Some will have a different uh, facial structure. Noses are bigger with some people, like, you know, Semitic people, like Jewish and Arab people, tend to have more prominent proboscises than, say, individuals of Scandinavian descent, for whatever reason. These are phenotypic, genetic uh, irregularities that are noticeable, but that doesn't mean that we're different races of people. So Paul says that everybody on Earth, no matter what ethnic group they're uh, uh, descended from, 
are from one blood. Even Jews and Gentiles are, are related to one another. Um, so he says, yeah, the God that made the world, um, who's given to all life and breath and all things, hath made from one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. In other words, he set boundaries and limits after the flood of Noah, the nations were divided out into continents by the waters that uh, after much of the waters had assuaged, God allowed much of the water to remain, to separate the various different geographical land masses that we now call continents. Why? Because he didn't want a repeat of the Tower of Babel, where the Tower of Babel, Nimrod under the possession of Satan tried to create a one world government and tried to be the leader of this one world government. So God scattered the people by changing their languages. After the flood, he had already scattered the continents by raising up water between them so that there would be a natural geographical boundary or barrier in the land masses that would prevent the people from becoming one and becoming manipulated by Satan. So one blood, different ethnicity. So he says, Paul goes on, God set out the bounds of their habitations and he said, the reason for that is this, verse 27. He says, that they should seek for the Lord, if happily they might feel after or grope for and find him, though he is not far from every one of us. So, he says, the reason that God separated men into different tribes of people is so that they would seek the Lord, if perhaps they might grope for and find him, and I just got hit by, ah, that was a raindrop, thank goodness. I was like, you know, sometimes, you know, they say it's good luck to get hit by a bird, but I prefer to be unlucky than, uh, I got the Lord, I don't need luck. So Paul is saying, yeah, he's saying that the reason for that is that they would seek for the Lord if happily they might grope for and find him, though he is not far from every one of us, and that that's a reality and a truism of particle physics and we'll find out that you know God isn't you know bajillion 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 miles away I mean the father's house is on outside the edge of the universe physically speaking that would be hundreds and hundreds of millions of trillions of light years away but because he's also in a different dimension the spiritual dimension is all around us at every point in time so you know people that experiment with DMT and all these experimental psychotropic drugs say they have experiences where right here on the earth, the dimension portal opens up and they can see beings that they would normally not see. I think Paul is describing something like that with relation to the kingdom of heaven. While physically, it actually does exist and it would be a hundred million light years away if you were in a ship. But it's also right here, we just can't see it. And so, Paul is saying that, you know, the separation of the nations came so that people would grow for and find God even though he's not far from every one of us. And then he goes on to say in verse 28, he says, for in him, God, we live and move and have our being. As certain of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. So Paul says that, look, in the real God of the universe, we live and move and have our being. And he says, you know, even some of your poets and philosophers, Aristotle and Plato, and Sophocles, they were all touching in, in some ways upon the concept that there is a God that's ascended above us and that there's more to life than just our pure physical bodies. He says, yeah, even, even some of your own poets, you know, uh, were able, and your great philosophers were able to sense that. They didn't know everything, but they, they had a sense of what was right. And so he says that, that they kind of, you know, uh, imperfectly opined on, I'm gonna explain to you, he says, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like under gold or silver or stone or graven uh, by art and man's device. And there's that word Godhead. I remember I was talking to my Jehovah's Witness friend a few years back and I had made the argument that the Trinity is biblical. I said, the Godhead is referred to in the Bible. She said, there's no reference to the Godhead in the Bible. That's a word you evangelical Trinitarians made up to support your trinity doctrine. And when I was able to point out and say, oh no, here it is, it's right here, the word Godhead, and here it is again. She was shocked and amazed. She was like, man, I, Jehovah's Witnesses said that that was a made up word. 
And again, what we find out then is that some of the things that people that are involved in religious denominations or religious organizations are told aren't necessarily consistent with what the Bible itself says, which is why we all have to become familiarized uh, with the Bible itself. So the word Godhead, which leaves open the door to the Trinity, is referred to. He says, we ought not to think that the Godhead or the God's nature is like unto gold or silver or stone uh, graven by art in man's device. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at it, says in the King James Version. It says he means, in essence, he overlooked it. Times of ignorance in, before Jesus came, God overlooked. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained for the task whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Who's he talking about, Steve? Right. So he's saying, you know, God overlooked, you know, Plato and Sophocles and Aristotle and the Greco-Roman gods and the divine Zoroaster and all that and men groping for different false gods. You know, those times of ignorance, you know, God understands. He, he, he overlooks that. But now he's calling all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because we went through the 6,000 year timeline of human history and now, as Paul is preaching, here we are. Here we are past the crucifixion. Jesus, God in human flesh has come in fulfillment of the first messianic prophecy of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He's come to the earth, died to pay back God, the sin debt of Adam so that all men can be born again and go into heaven. So now Paul is now establishing the church. So Paul is preaching on Mars Hill right about here on the timeline. So he says, God overlooked times of ignorance in the past, but now that Jesus has come, died, and rose from the dead, God is calling all men everywhere, of every ethnic group, of every geographical group, of uh, uh, location on the earth, to come and repent and believe a certain thing because there's coming a time when God will judge the world by the man he's appointed to the task. And he's talking about this judgment right here. So here it is, Adam, the fall in the garden, we're 2,000 years in, 3,000 years in, 4,000 years in, 5,000 years in, 6,000 years in. Now Paul is saying now we're just about out of time. The 6,000 years of human history or the six days of human creation are almost over. And that day of judgment is just right off here. So you have just a little bit more time left before it's time to judge. And when the judgment comes, you will have had to choose the right God. And that right God would be Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul says that now is the time for those of us to come and to believe on him. He says, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, and that man is none other than Jesus Christ. Uh, and then he goes on to say, where he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And then he goes on to conclude and he says, says, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. And so Paul departed from among them. So you had two different reactions, and generally you're going to have that whenever you go out into a public square such as this, and you're preaching the gospel to people you've never met before who might come from different ethnic backgrounds, might come from different cultural backgrounds, might come from different uh, socio-economic or religious backgrounds. When you start talking about God and human flesh being Jesus, who died and rose from the dead, some people are going to look at you strange and say, hey, that's not for me. And others are going to say, that might be for me. I just don't know enough yet. And I was going to say, sign me up. How do I get in? And so when they heard of the resurrection and the dead, some mocked. Some were like, oh, okay, that's too much for me. Right. So, wait, God came as a man, and then the Romans killed him. And then three days later, you, you're you saying he, he was back, and he was walking around and having lunch and dinner with people. Yeah, that's not, I don't believe that. And so some people said, nah, resurrection of the dead, that's too much. But others who didn't mock him said, we will hear thee again of this matter. In other words, that, 
I don't know. You know, I you know, I know that there's more to life than just this physical body. The idea that someone could come back from the dead, that isn't necessarily unbelievable. You know, and the Greco-Roman gods, you know, paganism, they believed in all kinds of supernatural stuff. They had even reincarnation. So the idea that somebody could be resurrected from the dead wasn't completely uh, a, a game-changing cutoff for some of the people. And they said, we're going to hear you again on this matter. And so it goes on to say, Paul departed from among them. And it says, verse 34, the final verse we're going to look at today, it says, Howbeit certain men clave unto him, which means clung to Paul. They became his followers, or followers of Jesus, and believed, among which was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So some theologians have said, well, Paul wasn't very successful in Athens because the way it ended, people said resurrection. Nah, I'm out. But no, they didn't look at the deeper meaning or the next verse. It says, though some found rising from the dead to be too much for them. I, I can't believe in, 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 in this Messiah if he has to die and come back. And many of the Jews say the same thing. They can't accept Jesus as the Messiah because he got himself killed. It's like, but he came back from the dead three days later, so what difference does it make? It's like, well, that's too much for us to believe. And so some of the, you know, the Areopagites and the Mars Hill uh, people felt the same way. But verse 34, it says, certain of the men that heard Paul clave unto him. And others like, tell us more. Oh, this is awesome. And they believed on Jesus. And among them was Dionysius. And it says, he was the Areopagite. And, and Areopagite, if you just look at the King James word, I thought the first few times that I read that, I thought it just meant that he was a citizen or somebody that dwelled in the area of Mars Hill. Like, you know, Athens is a big city and Mars Hill is like Washington Square Park. And so you'd say like the Greenwich Village, Village in person. The person who lives in Greenwich Village is in New York City, but the person that lives and Inwood, up on 125th Street, doesn't live in Greenwich Village, even though he's still in New York City. So I thought, when the first few times I read Areopagite, one of the believers was the Areopagite, I thought it just meant a guy who lived in close proximity to Washington Square Park, or lived in Greenwich Village, if you will, to use the New York analogy. But what that really means is that he was a member of the Supreme Command, or the Supreme Court, the Athenian High Council. It was really the Athenian equivalent to what the Jewish people called the Sanhedrin, their religious Supreme Court. This guy was a high governmental official. He was a member of the Athenian Supreme or High Council. And this is the guy who became a believer. So Dionysius, the Areopagite, the member of the you know Athenian Supreme Council, became a follower of Jesus Christ, as well as a woman named Damaris. And you always see men and women are accepting the gospel. It's not just for men, it's not just for women. Uh, you know, remember that just for men? Isn't that like a hair club or something when you lose your hair? The gospel isn't just for men. The gospel is for men and women, and that's free, and you guys can take whatever you want. Um, the gospel is for whoever is interested in eternal life and living forever and being able to have peace and prosperity, not in this material world, but in the world to come. And so Dionysius, the High Council, Athenian Supreme Court member, that's crazy, you know, a member of the Athenian Supreme Court became a follower of Jesus Christ because of Paul's, you know, crazy, uh, foolish babbling. What is this babbler babbling about on Mars Hill? A lump of ground just like this, you know, so I don't know. I, you know, I've come out here many times. I haven't had a Supreme Court justice uh, come and accept Christ yet, Steve, uh, but who knows? You know, I've had to appear before them before in different court cases as a trial attorney, but, uh, or an appellate attorney as well. But uh, no, I, I've yet to, to be able to convert one while I'm preaching here on South Beach. So Paul, this one time, he didn't go to Mars Hill uh, 20 times or 30 times. Paul didn't make Mars Hill like his mission in life. The very first time Paul went out to Mars Hill and preached Christ crucified to the people of Athens, the very first time he converted a member of their Athenian Supreme Court. And that's because the Holy Spirit that had inspired him when he was supposed to be staying at home and laying low until uh, Silas and Timothy gave him the all clear and told him to come on over to Corinth and start preaching. He decided to go out and got himself mixed up 
with some guys he had never met before, and they said, hey, come on over to Mars Hill, and let's let you preach there where all the great philosophers, to see how you how you do there, man. That, that, that separates the men from the boys. That's where the real philosophers are. And he went there, and he preached with such sincerity, and with what such clarity, and with such intellectual reasoning, that he was able to convert a number of people, including a member of the Athenian Supreme Court to become followers of Jesus Christ. And so that is, you know, yeah, that's attributable, Steve, to the power of the gospel, as you said. It's the gospel that did that. It wasn't Paul that did that. So anybody that suggests Paul was not successful at Mars Hill, no, that's not true. And in fact, that was one of the primary uh, sermons that caught my eye as a kid when I was first reading through the book of Acts. You know, to the unknown God I remember reading about. And then he said, you know, God whom you ignorantly worship, who created, gave us life and breath and all things, has, you know, called us to a time of repentance. And I'll just read through that. Again, his Mars Hill sermon, you can be summed up briefly, is this. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, well, it's not in temples made with hands. The temple was about to be destroyed in a few years because Jesus said God's spirit had left it as a result of his death on the cross and resurrection. There was no need for a temple. God would dwell in our hearts instead of a building. It says, God that made the world and all things there and seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times and before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. And he says, what's the reason for this? That they should seek for the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, grope for and find him, though he is not far from every one of us, for in him we live, and move and have our being. Steve, in him we live and move and have our being. You know, we're groping for the Lord. And the whole point of us coming out here is to help people understand the truth of that. So with that, we've made it through Paul's Mars Hill address. And again, those of you out there in internet land that are not yet saved, the gospel of Jesus Christ is for you. It's very simple, believing that he's God in human flesh entering into a metaphysical marriage relationship with him that will last forever is a decision only you can make and once you make that you will be part of the new heavens and the new earth that's coming and for everybody else that doesn't steve when we get to the judgment of the great white throne here that's going to be a terrible time man because everybody there will fail the test no matter how good they are they won't be good enough to get into heaven which means they'll have to wind up in hell we don't we don't want that Paul's the, the mission and the example that Paul demonstrated for us was to go out even to pagans, even to people that had never heard of Jesus. He went to the synagogue, sure. They knew about the gospel of, or the, the writings of Moses. But then he went to Mars Hill, where the pagans were, where they were worshiping Greco-Roman gods and Zoroastrian gods, and they knew nothing of Jesus Christ or even the Jewish prophecies related to him. And it was to that group that Paul preached the simple gospel that I just read to you, just summed up in three or four verses, and he was able to convert a number of people to follow Jesus Christ, including a member of the Athenian Supreme Court. In one sermon, he didn't have to call fire down from heaven, he didn't have to use Benny Hinn, signs and wonder, magic tricks. In one sermon, very simple, he preached Christ crucified only. And that is the simplicity of the gospel that saves Steve, as we have a Miami Beach fire truck making sound effects for us just to show you that I can modulate my voice when necessary. <clears throat> but yeah, Paul didn't use tricks, magic, signs, or wonders. He used the simple gospel based upon the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus from the dead, claiming that he is God and that he created all of us and gives to all of us life and breath and all things says now's the time to step away from our pagan practices worshiping these false gods for God has appointed a man that 
through whom he will judge the world, and the man he appointed for that task is Jesus Christ. And that judgment is the judgment of the great white throne, Steve. Everybody's going to fail that judgment. And so we need to get saved now so we can appear at the earlier judgment, the judgment of the Bema Seat, or the judgment of the church. The rewards judgment is for those that get saved. That comes 1,007 years before the great white throne judgment. When you get to the great white throne judgment, everybody there is going to fail that judgment, Steve, and going to wind up somewhere in hell. And that's a sad thing. And Paul said, you know, yeah, it, it ought not be that way. The God that created all things, gave you life, breath, and all things is calling you to come and believe. And some people, you know, criticize it as easy believism. It's supposed to be easy because God loves you. He doesn't want it to be hard. Because if it's hard, lots and lots of people wind up in hell simply because it was hard to get yourself saved. So he made it as easy as possible. Why? Because he wants everybody, not most people, contrary to what Calvinists believe and what the you know predestination perversions of the Presbyterian Church over the years have has become. He wants everybody. God has predestined every son of Adam to be born again and reign and rule with his son Jesus throughout eternity. Not everybody will because he's given us free will and we get to choose for or against him. It's just like if a guy comes up and says, will you marry me? If he puts a gun to the woman's head and says, I'll blow your brains out if you don't, and when she says, I do, it doesn't mean anything. But if he gives her the option and she says, yes, then it means something. And that's that's the option, that, that's the opportunity that, that Jesus is presenting to us. God is saying, will you accept my son? Jesus says, will you accept me? You know, I'm, I can't force you to do it, but I want you to. And if you do it, you have eternal life. If you don't, then eventually the wrath of God the Father falls down upon everyone who has rejected the Son. We've looked at that throughout the book of Revelation. For those of you that haven't had a chance to see that, go to our YouTube page, Southeast Gospel Ministries. Take a look at the series on the book of Revelation and all the stuff that happens. You know, from Revelation 17 through Revelation 19, man, that 17, 18, and 19 are not for the faint of heart. And we can avoid all of that by accepting the simple gospel and Mars Hill, man, what a great sermon. It didn't, Paul didn't use a whole lot of theological tomfoolery. He didn't speak in tongues. He didn't cause fire to fall down from heaven. He just preached Christ crucified. And even to the ignorant pagans who knew nothing about Moses or the Old Testament or Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or the 70 weeks of Daniel, they just heard Jesus was God. He died for our sins and then rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, we can too. And judgment's coming. Accept him now. Even an Athenian Supreme Court justice accepted that simplicity of the gospel and became born again. We can do the same. We did the same when we became born again. And that simple gospel that Paul preached, as I gave it to you today, any one of us can do that, Steve. You don't have to go to divinity school and get a theology doctorate to be able to do that simple gospel that Paul preached. And remember, amongst the many converts on Mars Hill that day was an Athenian Supreme Court justice. So how simple was Paul's gospel? It was simple enough to get a Supreme Court justice who had been trained in paganism and believing in false religious systems converted on the spot because it wasn't Paul's awesomeness. It wasn't Paul's academic acumen. It wasn't Paul's academic training. It was the Holy Spirit working through Paul who was preaching forth what? The simplicity of the gospel. The gospel is no man's debtor and it's its own power unto salvation to everyone who believes, the Bible says. And our job isn't to force the masses to believe. That's beyond our power to do. We don't have to make people believe it. What we have, oh, no problem, no problem, God bless. You. What we do is we present the gospel to the people just as they pass by, just like we got the bikers riding right through our Bible study. That's Mars Hill for you, man. You got all kinds of stuff going on. We're not in the pulpit. We don't have stained glass windows anywhere or velvet covered, you know, you know, lecterns or anything like that. We got real people of every type of stripe and every belief and every faith system, Steve. And you've done a great job getting them the gospel in the form of those chick cracks today, Steve. Thank you for that. And uh, and that's the that's the message. So I'm trying to encourage the people to do that. And with that, we we wind up, we close up for today. Steve, why don't you come over here and why don't you close this up in a word of prayer? Thank you so much for your efforts today. Lord, we thank you again for another opportunity for us to come out and be part of your will. Lord, we thank you for the Mars Hill Sermon. And just, Lord, how simple 
the gospel is and the power that you allowed Paul to demonstrate for us, Lord. It's just something that I hope we all can uh, you know, take something from and be able to go out and like Herb was mentioning earlier, so that folks will know in all the towns and little cities that we all live in here, Lord, those who have been born again will go out and share the gospel. Uh, that uh, you died for us, you paid the sin debt that we could never pay, Lord. Before our accepting it, you give us eternal salvation. Great deal for us. Hate that you had to do it, but yeah. so grateful for it, Lord. Better him than us. <laughs> for so, sure. Thank for you, sure. Lord, for that. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, so with that then, Steve, yes, sir. We've, we've, we've reached a, uh, another another Saturday sermon in, in, in the can. Man. And hopefully, this will be the last one, or maybe oh, oh, very soon the well, last one. Because very shortly, it is. <laughs> who knows, the Lord will be calling down from heaven, the oh, final man. trumpet blast, and we will be up and out of here. And so... If that doesn't happen, we will see you again next Saturday, Thursday night, 7 uh, to 9 p.m. at southbeachgospel.com live or uh, upload it, uh, you know, time delayed on YouTube at South Beach Gospel Ministries on YouTube. So like and subscribe. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.